How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Seth Julian, welcoming you to today's session entitled Time to Buy Banks, Sell Tech, Maybe, uh, Market Trading Opportunities. Um, we are going to take a look at some of the common wisdom or common thinking, I shouldn't say wisdom, about banks and tech stocks in the current environment that we're in. Inflation is here and it's bubbling robustly. Two variables largely explain why inflation is present for the first time in nearly four decades. First, it's the plague. The sudden appearance caused the government-mandated closure of the world's economic system, and be aware that this is the first time this has happened in recorded economic history. Usually, in the case of an economic downturn or economic uh, tr uh, resistance, the government encourages us to continue working in the face of war, in the face of disease, famine, we're encouraged to continue to try and maintain economic activity. This time was not the case. This time we were instructed to leave work and stay at home. The result was a stunning decline in output and economic activity, both demand and supply. Now, remarkably, quick de remarkably quickly, demand spiked up. Within 90 days, I should even say 50, 75 days of the end of Q1, where the um, plague had struck in 2020, demand spiked up. The supply, manufacturing, and distribution systems of the world could not recover as quickly as demand, and therefore prices rose to compensate for the differences. The second variable is the outbreak of warfare in Euroland. Russia and Ukraine together account for substantial supplies of crucial commodity products consumed in enormous quantities around the world. Goods such as cereals, edible oils, and of course hydrocarbons are all exiting the markets with no commensurate reduction in demand and therefore prices are rising to compensate for the imbalance. Russia and the Ukraine account uh, together for over a third of the world's wheat supply. That's bread, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Ukraine itself accounts for something like 60% of the world's canola, edible oil, rapeseed oil, uh, supply itself. And of course, when we're talking about uh, Russia, we're talking about hydrocarbons in enormous quantities, natural gas, oil. When they come off the market, doesn't mean that the demand for them has, has uh, disappeared. On the contrary, demand is going to go up because supply has contracted, the old supply and demand axiom. Now, neither of these factors, that is to say the pandemic or the war in Euroland are about to end soon. Um, in fact, what we see from well, the plague that's related, the plague-related supply line kinks are seeing continued aggregation as the Chinese Communist Party maintains its utterly ineffectual zero tolerance policy. This may not be news to you; it's apparently news to the Chinese Communist Party. The COVID-19 um, virus doesn't care about the Communist Party's zero tolerance. It's highly, it's highly aggressive, it's highly um, uh, infectious, and it's spreading like wildfire, despite their zero tolerance policy. Their um, um, inoculation regime is weak. They've mostly inoculated the young parts of the population, leaving the elderly uninoculated. They closed down entire so they don't close them down. Let's be clear about this. They put the citizens under house arrest, which is, by the way, generating terrific resistance. And it's not getting anywhere. And we are only going to see the effects of those kinks in the supply chain later on. Remember, Shanghai, which is currently in under house arrest, is a huge engine of trade in the world. They're the world's workshop. The war in Ukraine is likely, as it is as it did in Grozny and Transnistria in Moldova to grind on for years. So these two factors, uh, edging inflation up, are going to be with us for a while. Now, what does the world? How does the world react to such um, inflation? Central banks re respond to rising price levels usually too late because they always resist engendering a recession, which rises. Uh, as the cost of capital rises, you, um, and therefore recessions are the outcome. There's an old saying on Wall Street that says, 
When the tide goes out, we see who has been swimming without a bathing suit. What that means is that when money is cheap, it's very easy to be profitable. And money has been cheap now since, let's call it 2008, 2009. The interest rate has been very low. Money has been cheap. And therefore, profits have been easily generated. You don't have to, it doesn't cost much to return the money you borrowed to generate those profits. However, once the interest rate goes up, once the cost of that capital goes up, uh, that's going to affect your bottom line. And so if the top line stays the same, that is to say revenue, and your expenses rise, that is to say um, interest payments, your profits are going to shrink. And this rise in interest rates is usually good news for banks in the long term. And this is the reason I... I mentioned it, obviously, in the context of corporate profits, but specifically in the case of banks. Banking is a relatively simple business. Depositors are paid, say, 2% for leaving their excess cash in a bank, which the bank then lends out for 5%. The difference is the bank's profit. It's about all there is to it. Banking is a simple industry. Therefore, the current rise in interest should benefit the banks. Now, we're going to take a look at this in a moment in real time in the actual charts, but that's the theory. However, all banks are not created equally. As was the case in the recovery from the initial outbreak of the pandemic, not all firms profited equally. And this is so too the case with banks. Some of the banks have large exposure to the Russian market. This means that in the near term, loan loss allowances are going to rise and asset values are being written down or off entirely. So let's look at the banks and see which are rising and which are not. Let's take a quick look at the banks. Well, actually, let's continue with our presentation, and then we'll look at the banks. Uh, also, I want to talk about the tech giants. Each of the megatech gi gargantuans shown here, and of course, this is the usual suspects, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, a.k.a. Facebook, profited handsomely in the wake of the pandemic recovery. As society adjusted to working from home, Retooling home offices, making homes cozier, ordering in, etc. These firms earn huge profits. In doing so, they continued attracting the attention of governments concerned that they also control outsized proportions of the economic landscape. In other words, these firms are headed closer to the rocks of regulation. I assure you of that. And if you don't uh, you don't need to believe me. Look what the European Union is doing to these tech giants themselves. They're putting a leash on them. They're restricting them. They're restraining them from domination. The United States is very slow. It, the United States has not rewritten its antitrust laws in 120 years. The U.S. antitrust laws were written at the end of the 19th century. The Sherman Antitrust Act goes back to 1912. So the regulation of these giant corporations is, is long overdue, and it will come. Um, as well, the supply line backups and kinks that have slowed their ability to supply the demand resulting from the recovery. Uh, they've, tried, they've had workarounds. Some of them are able to. I know that Amazon and Walmart have booked their own container ships to try and overcome the shortage of containers. But still, a recession that results from the removal of the punch bowl, and by that we mean the meaning cheap capital in the form of nearly free cash, is going to curtail their sales and therefore their outside profits. Similar to the banks, there are tech giants who will be able to pass along rising costs to their customers and those that will be constrained in doing so. There are those who will see no serious decline in their sales and those who are quite adversely affected. So now we'll have a look at the charts to discern who the likely beneficiaries versus the disadvantage are likely to be. Now then, let's take first a look at the banks. What I want you to see here, if this thing would stop flashing, is this is all the banks we have here on the platform, which is quite a sizable selection. City, Royal Bank of Scotland, Wells Fargo. These are what are called the mega banks, the money center banks of the world. There's only one on this chart that is looking profitable, Standard Chartered. Standard Chartered is, um, is uh, printing a 
rising stock price. Now, Standard Chartered is a top-end lender in Europe. It's a, uh, a well-respected bank, and its stock price is currently trading above the 20, the 50, and the 200-day moving average with increased volumes, above average volumes. These are the classic signs of a trend that's likely to stay in train. However, I want to bring to attention some other banks which, may, which are surprisingly not as well positioned. Take a look at Citibank. Despite the rise in interest rates, despite the expected rise and continued the continued expected rise in interest rates, Citibank is continuing to <laughs> lose value. Now, one of the reasons may be, and this is a uh, this is this is speculation on our part, but we've researched this and we believe this to be the case. Fear of recession means that there's a fear that these banks won't be able to lend into that recession. As we said earlier, you take in deposits of two, you collect five on the loans, and that's your profit. If the loan revenue is down or loans are scheduled to go bad, stock price of a bank is likely to fall. And we see this phenomenon largely across the board. Morgan Stanley, um, Societe Generale, Barclays, Bank of America, Citi, again, J.P. Morgan. These banks are not looking particularly healthy in the face of rising interest. So that's one of the messages we want to leave you with today. The idea that rising interest rates are necessarily going to good, be good for banks, uh, correct to the moment, is false. It's not benefiting the banks, and the banks are continuing to lose money. Now let's take a look at some of those tech stocks we mentioned earlier before. If we look at technology corporations, and this is a very wide stable of firms in this category, we see that they have eased off. Netflix, of course, we know has fallen terrifically. Look at the stock, that stock price. It's fallen on tremendous volume, meaning that this trend is likely to stay in train. And that is because, and this is a classic example of what we were talking about earlier when we mentioned that strength that was gained from the recovery in the pandemic has now dissipated. People are returning to work. There was a time after the, in the second and in the third and fourth quarters of 2020 and the early quarters of 2021, the average American household had more than four subscriptions to streaming services. Think about that. They were laying around watching TV day and night. Well, those days are over. And Netflix stock reflects that reality. Um, now, let's, sit, let's take a look at Microsoft. Microsoft did remarkably well out of the pandemic. Here it is. Recovered, but it's fallen off again. These stocks, Microsoft is a classic example of a stock that benefited handsomely from the work at home phenomena. As people stayed at home, they had to buy cameras and keyboards and microphones and computers and screens. And Microsoft benefited handsomely from that uh, trend. The days, those days are over. They're down. Microsoft is trading below its moving average on tremendous volume. So this trend again, likely to stay in. So, what we're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is a pattern of declining sales, declining stock prices in the face of an oncoming recession. There is no doubt in our mind that the sell-off, and let's take a final look. We, need, look, we can look at some of the indices to get an overview, a broad uh, overview of these markets. Except for the Tada wool, which is which is booming because 20.2 percent of the Tada wool is explained by Saudi Aramco, whose profits are entirely explained by the price of oil, which are just going to continue going up. But outside the Tada wool and this, this is the dollar index. It's not a stock index. Virtually, ev not virtually, every single index is plummeting. That tells us that we're headed into a recession. That. The good times are over, the cost of capital is going up, 
and we see sell-offs across the board. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take leave of our session today. This is your host, Seth Julian, wishing you all, ladies, all ladies and gentlemen the ability to trade with confidence. Bye-bye for now.